Yep. See you. Yep. Okay. So I'll let her take it away. Great. And really nice meeting you. And of course, it's, it's great to have a small group so we can all just have a discussion. Um, and Linda, what you just said is, is probably what I need personally to um, <laughs> get my finances in order. And it's embarrassing because I've been in finance 15 years um, and probably more common. No, than no than judgment. Right. Um, but yeah, I, so today I, I was going to, uh, I'd love to just tell you about my background and then talk about um, really the topic is, is values-based investing or sustainable investing, whatever you want to call it. But I'm sure everyone's seen this become more and more mainstream over the past year, especially, and the demand for this type of investing, which, you know, is not really a side asset class, but really the future of investing. So it's so important, I think, to talk about and then tell you, um, you know, what, what we're doing at, where we're doing at Seeds. Um, so anyway, so we'll start with my story. Um, I was at uh, BlackRock and JP Morgan, so I was in what I call like big finance the last 15 years, and uh, my role is in product development. So what that means is I worked with the sales side and marketing to understand what type of products clients wanted, and then worked with the investment teams um, and what we could deliver and what we could create, and then actually working with you know legal operations, everybody else to, to put together design investment funds, so mutual funds. Um, and launch them to market. And um, I love that because I really got a good understanding of, of wealth management. And I think it was about seven years ago, I was at BlackRock and I, I, I learned about something called impact investing. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. This makes money meaningful. You can actually you know, re readjust kind of who you're investing in and how you're investing and be also investing for, for a better world, world or in companies that are doing better. And I was like, wow, this is great. I started being really excited talking about it almost like a side hobby. And at the time I got a lot of pushback about it. Like it was kind of like, oh, that's a millennial thing. Like, oh, is this a charity? What, you know, kind of it, it was, um, it, and at the time it wasn't totally unfair because years ago, um, you know, impact investing, a lot of it was negative screens. So a lot of it was like, let's just take tobacco or certain certain industries and sectors out. And of course, if you do that, when you're investing, you are probably gonna underperform because you're not gonna have a diversified portfolio. But luckily over time, what I've seen, and eventually it became a thing at BlackRock, I launched a few funds there. Um, it, it, it's more, you know, there's other forms of this sustainable investing and in particular, what we'll talk about today is ESG, which is what Seeds does. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so luckily, like over time, it became a thing. I left and went to JP Morgan, the private bank, not related to impact, but basically building a whole new asset management platform within the private bank, which was really cool. But um, as I saw, like more and more sustainable investing was becoming a thing in the industry, I wanted to be part of that and directly building that because that's what I like to do, build products and platforms. And um, so I left a year ago to be part of Creating Seeds, which is a fintech startup. And what we do is we, it's a technology platform for financial advisors where they can sit down with a client and have that conversation about what the client's values are and then present a full portfolio. So um, I met, it was basically a networking event. I met um, the founder and CEO of Seeds who, who I created it with, um, Zach Conway. And he was a financial advisor, is a financial advisor by background. So what he saw is a lot of advisors don't know how to have the conversation. Um, if, if a client is asking for this, they also don't know how to put the portfolio together. It's very confusing. There's so many products, there's so many ETFs now. Every fund is now called ESG something or other. And so what Seeds is solving is that, is like enabling the advisor, making them like the expert in this. So they, they're basically sitting down, walking through a survey with their client, really simple survey, and then being able to present, hey, I know you, and here, here you go. And I love what you said, Linda, about the psychology, because that's another thing that we incorporated in, in that survey process and platform is the first, there are a few questions about how does the investor think? So like, do they think more analytically or they think big picture? Do they want to know like the data around it? Do they want to know, do they want to hear a story about a company that's doing good in the world? Um, and so at the end of the survey process on the screen, it's, here's who you are as an investor. So almost like a personality profile. And then it's, and this is what you said is important to you in earth, people and corporate integrity. And then 
here is a proposed investment portfolio. So Seeds is also the sub-advisor. And then recently we just announced our partnership with Alliance Bernstein, which I think gives us more credibility partnering with more asset managers and their capabilities to present a full portfolio. Um, so, um, and I love like when I met Barb and, and the team here, um, I just love what Purse Strings does too, because I've also been involved with, with microfinance um, and I'm on the a nonprofit board. And so anything that helps empower women and brings women together and lifts them up is um, I'm passionate about. And so I'm, I'm like, my life is now aligned with kind of what I believe in, which is awesome. Um, so I had, I don't know how much um, everyone knows about ESG or not, but I'd love to just give like a little bit of, of show some stories and just go into kind of what it is and demand. I have a few slides I'm gonna bring up. I present. All right, I know we're, um, we don't have so much time today, but anyway, so, so I mean, the time is now, right? For the sustainable investing, you may have seen the flows, which doubled over last year for retail funds in the US um, into ESG products. And this is, um, I think, 25% of total net flows. So it's really become a thing. And why is that? I think it's because, you know, in the pandemic over the last year, we're all home and we're watching how are companies treating their employees? What's happening? Like all these climate crises, people are, you know, marching about social injustices. And so we're all thinking like, well, what are we doing in the world? And realizing that our money can have an impact dependent, like how we spend our money actually matters, how we invest our money matters. And so I think the, the pandemic, while it was challenging in a lot of ways, it really has pushed a lot of the momentum toward um, investing in companies that are better in terms of um, ESG, which is uh, factors that are environmental, social and governance factors. And so um, I'm sure you've seen like in almost every news source and headline, there's, this is, it's all over now. Every asset manager, every news source is now talking about it. So it's become a lot more mainstream and it's not just for, um, people that are like, oh, let me just save the rainforest, but it actually shows that investing in companies that are doing better for their stakeholders actually makes business sense. Um, we'll talk more about that as I give examples. The other thing that's driving momentum, of course, is the change in administration. So now with the new administration, there's a lot of these like green policies, rejoining the climate accord. So no matter, it's not a political thing. It doesn't matter really what, what side you're on or what politics you believe, but, um, but of course, any policies the company the, the country adopts is going to affect business, right? So businesses can't ignore this. This is something where it is going to affect their operations and um, yeah, and how they operate. And so there's different types of sustainable investing, right? So I talked a little bit about this. Socially responsible is the negative screening. So that's kind of where it started. And then there's different types of ESG considerations. So whether you're, you're using just like financial factors and different ways you're, you're valuing a company or investment, you're integrating these other types of risk exposures and opportunities. So how efficient are a company's operations? Like how are they dealing with operations as it exists, you know, in, in terms of efficiency with the, with the climate? Are they polluting? Are they not polluting? How are they treating their supply chains and their employees? So really like looking at all of these additional factors um, in terms of making a decision about whether to invest in a certain company. And then there's um, all the way on the right, there's impact, which um, is becoming more and more known as, as impact is more like the product the company um, creates. So if a company or a project cr is creating like windmills or renewable energy, or like there's a positive impact to what the company is doing, whereas, and we'll see in a minute, ESG can be, a, any company can be really great from an ESG perspective. It's more about the business operations. Does anyone have any questions up front before? I, I wanna go into just a few um, companies just to give an example. Hi, okay, so here's a real basic one. I may have missed this. What does ESG actually stand for? <laughs> That's a great question. No one knows and it's not that important, but, but no, it's um, environmental, uh, social and governance. Issues. Okay. But, but to that point, I mean, a lot of people don't know what ESG stands for. And I, I feel like it, it's, it's a confusing acronym and it doesn't quite matter. Like, I don't know if there's a better way to call it, but it's more about the meaning of it, right? Like what happened. Yeah. Eventually, I think the ESG is not gonna be a thing, which is why, you know, at Seeds, it's more for us about um, 
personalizing the advisor to client experience, about aligning with values and personalization rather than like selling an ESG portfolio, right? It's not like selling real estate or selling this other asset class. So it's more about integrating this in how we think and also how we invest. It, Kristen, um, I had a question. So yeah. um, like anything, when things get popular, like it's a popular thing that's happening and people are requesting socially responsible. Um, there's been some negative stuff in the news about, you know, people thinking that they're um, investing in a socially responsible, but they're really not, or their their advisors advising them of that. And so the, the transparency and the due diligence and all, do you guys do that so that like me as an advisor, if I'm making this recommendation or is that on me to make sure that everything is transparent? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. We, at, at Seeds, we do that. We help the advisors through the whole journey. And then afterward, meaning when you're when an advisor is working with their client, let's say they, they've done the proposal, they open up a portfolio for their client in this way, Seeds then provides ongoing information and materials to the advisor to like pass on to the client. And so both the client and the advisor can have this kind of like, they, you both can have a dashboard experience and, and interact in that way if you like or not. But, um, but that's why it's important, we think, to have um, some type of support or platform with seats because advisors have so much going on and so many other things to think about and worry about. They're not going to just be like in the news, like searching about ESG and all of that. Like, so having this to actually like help them with their conversations with clients. So I think that's important. But, um, but you're right, there is a lot of news either way. And I think more and more, um, what's changed over the past couple of years too is the investment thesis. So a lot of the large um, investment managers and banks and asset managers are now agreeing that this is actually good for investing. That the biggest thing is the performance, right? So like, you, you, what's the give up? It's like, what's the give up about this? But it seems it's, I don't know, all of, yeah, all of, there's still critics about it, but I think more and more people are realizing like, like yeah, companies that are better to their employees might be a better long-term investment. Did that answer your question? Yeah, because it's, you know, I, there are some platforms that we're offered to use and when we have those screeners and it, yeah. like you said, in the beginning, it was just like tobacco and alcohol. And then now there's like hundreds of things I can screen out. <laughs> And it's yeah, kind of it's just too much. So it's kind of a madness, you know. So I I I shy away from it because you know I'm not confident exactly in the process. Yeah. And that's totally common. That's what we hear all the time from advisors. Which and it, it makes sense. It's like even as an investor, let's say I'm the end investor, I don't know what hundred check boxes like I I want or I didn't want. Like I haven't thought about all of the issues that I care about. So at, at Seeds, we bring it up a level. There's like nine different, um, in areas of, of environment and social and governance, there, there's nine different kind of high level themes that a client will rank. And we think that's totally different than some of these other providers, to your point, that you go through this checklist with a client of like 100 checkboxes, and it's confusing for the advisors, confusing for the client, and you're like down some rabbit hole, and then it becomes political. Anyway, so yeah, it's important. Um, that's what we're trying to make it like it, important for people to be able to invest in this way, um, but not have it like so overwhelming. Um, certain, like very few clients are going to really feel like strongly about checking or not checking a hundred boxes. So, so yes, great. Um, so anyway, so these are just a few case studies to bring it to life. So Home Depot, um, you know, this is a company that kind of everyone knows, right? If you're conservative or you're liberal, like it could be a fine investment, like, and just an example of something that's good ESG, I mean, in the pandemic, they were increasing pay to employees, right? Which was a, a short-term financial hit on the company. But, you know, we think that the thesis is it's going to pay long-term dividends when there's less lawsuits of employees, there's more happy employees, there's less, and that can really um, build a better company, right? And so the thesis is in the long run, the company is going to be a better investment and have better value if they have a better culture and workforce. They're also doing other things like becoming more energy efficient, et cetera. So this is just a good example that's like, oh, it's a mainstream company. When you say ESG, does that mean I'm investing in like wind farms in Iceland? Like what is it? But this is like a very common mainstream company. Um, another example of, you know, not so good ESG. Everyone remembers this, the BP oil spill. I don't know, was it 10 years ago? Um, 
but you know, it would be great to know as an investor, right, that this company had uh, their safety protocols for their employees were not great, and for how you know they were basically not maintaining their oil rigs. So that that would be great, and it's and it became incredibly financially material to the company when they they're paying. Obviously, it was a huge disaster in human life, but also in like financially. So this is you know obviously an example of like the operations and how a company is operating affects you know, their stakeholders and their shareholders, their financial position. Um, I like to put this one in because people think like ESG is just screening out like, like alcohol and other things. And again, like that's, um, that could be maybe when you're thinking impact investment, but for ESG, any company like Heineken is actually uh, really great from an ESG perspective. They align with the UN sustainable development goals. So SDGs, if you guys heard of that, it's, um, we don't have time to go through the whole thing now, but a lot of uh, companies and investment managers are now trying to align their investments to the SDGs, which are, you know, ways to, I guess, change the world, help the world that, that um, many countries agreed on a few years ago. Um, but yeah, like a company like this can do a lot, right? Because they're using a lot of water resources and plants and operations. So if they change how they're actually operating, it can make a big difference in terms of their communities and their stakeholders in the world. So um, another example of good ESG. And then this is the punchline. So a lot of, you know, as financial professionals, a lot of your clients may be invested, you know, may feel strongly about certain values and interests. And they may be invested in an ETF that actually holds things like private prisons, right? So main, mainstream ETFs that are probably in all of our portfolios have things like this in it. And it's kind of antithetical to a lot of things that, um, your clients or people believe. So, um, so that's the big thing. Like what we're doing, what we're doing at Seeds um, is trying to, to work with advisors that work with their clients. A lot of clients are investing in these public projects, like, oh, we're doing that. We're on the cap table of this awesome, um, you know, new way of like doing renewable energy, whatever it is. And then you look at their main portfolio and they're invested in like a main ETF that that is totally um, opposite of what they believe in. And so um, what we're doing at Seeds, like I said, is a, is a financial platform that advisors use to talk about personal values and financial goals and then bring them together in a proposal. And um, it's not the only way you can do this. Of course, um, there's ETFs, there's mutual funds, kind of on one side of the spectrum that are, um, it, it's, I think it's great that there's so many offerings now. Again, it's confusing, but it's great that everyone is, is trying to offer something. And then there's those a lot of robo advisors that are doing more direct indexing, kind of on this angle. Direct indexing is like reweighting an index and taking things out, um, and that is very customized. But again, you're kind of still including things potentially that the client doesn't want. What we're doing as seeds is like building portfolios from the ground up. So once we know, once an advisor knows what a client believes in in those nine areas then building a portfolio of actual companies. So like 60 stocks that align with that, that's also a good diversified portfolio on the equity side. And then on the fixed income side, there's um, there, we're building a portfolio of funds and we and um, partnering with others like Alliance Bernstein to offer tax exempt. Um, so anyway, this is just a, a snapshot of kind of a platform I just talked about and the process that an advisor would go through working with seeds. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's what I wanted to cover. So we covered what was ESG, why it's so important, and then how you can do that. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, Kristen, um, so for an advisor to get access to this, is it, is it through you guys partner with it? You partnered with Alliance Bernstein, or is this available to individual advisors? Just, does it have to go through who they're affiliated with or? Yeah, so we partner with large advisory platforms. So our first client is a $5 billion RA located in New Jersey. And all you know, 50 plus advisor teams have access to this, to Seeds, just like they would have access to Salesforce or Morningstar or kind of another tool. And so we are looking for other advisors and mainly advisory firms, right? So we're trying to like partner with the advisory firm to offer, um, this as a personalization tool. And so we're both this kind of tool for advisors. And then if clients want to open an account, 
we're then also the sub-advisor. So we'll manage the actual equity and taxable fixed income portfolios as, as any sub-advisor as any sub-advisor you'd work with. And then um and then Alliance Bernstein is on for tax. So it's exam. considered it's considered like a TAMP, right? And then you guys, or is it not? And then you, and it's branded per that larger RIA. Well, yeah, it's always through the RIA. So is I'm it, not sure if we call ourselves a TAMP or not. I, know I not. would think it sounds much. Hi, Gigi here. Sorry for <laughs> being late, everybody. Um, it sounds to me more like it's a, and I'll use another acronym, which I hate, SMA, a SMA. separately managed account, right? That's what it kind of just, but I'm walking in, you know, very last minute. So I apologize for interrupting. Yeah, you. so it's this, it's similar to an SMA because it is a basket of, of individual yeah. actions that a client holds. But it's not an SMA because it's not like, all right, so which one would you like? Would you like SMA one, two, three, four? It's really an integrated process, meaning the advisor sits down, goes through the survey, and then the proposal, it's a customized portfolio built for your client. So it's not like, let's check, choose one off the shelf. It's really then the client gets proposed. Here, you said, you know, you care about earth issues first, people issues, then corporate integrity issues. Here are 60 companies that align with that. Now, many clients get like the same core companies, right? That we believe in through our data process. Um, but then there's also, we have a human element of portfolio management and trading that customizes the portfolios and manages them as well. Um, so yes, on the fixed income side, we do have our fixed income portfolio is an SMA, meaning it's it's the same portfolio that, we, that we've, we've created. Um, and what I did is, is we, talk to many of my industry contacts. So we went back to my, you know, BlackRock and, and Naveen and PIMCO and everyone else that like I worked with on the street and taught and asked them about their fixed income portfolios, made sure they aligned with what we believe in in terms of ESG integration and then created a portfolio of funds on the fixed income side. So, so um, Barb and Maggie, for you, just so you know, a separately, separately managed account is what we as investment advisors use. So we can go out to the world depending on how much money our clients have and what's approved on our book of business. It's called a platform. And what that does is that allows us to go, okay, yeah, I want to use seeds for this part of the portfolio. I want to use, you know, this for this part of the portfolio. I want to use Madison over here for my equities, you know. So that's that allows us the freedom to really dive deep to help our clients. So yeah. I, I know you two are super experts in that. So I just wanted to let you know what that was. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and Kristen, when you talked about the um, survey or whatever it is, assessment, is that um, each client takes that assessment um, and the assessment is provided by the um, by your financial representative? They give you that assessment and that's how they select the seeds for you? That, that's correct. Yeah, so it's it's basically like a Zoom like this, or I guess in person one day, you would bring up the seeds dashboard on the screen and walk through a survey. The, the advisor would walk through a survey with your client and it would facilitate this conversation about what's meaningful to your client. And so it's, it's really quick, it's only 13 questions. And at the end of that, the advisor then can present a proposal that says, here's your customized, here's what I heard. First, here's what kind of an investor you are, how you think how you make decisions with your heart and your mind. So your, your investor profile, then it's, you said these issues are important to you from an ESG perspective. And then here's a portfolio for you, like a proposal for you. And yeah, a, yeah. the advisor then can decide what, you know, with the client, what makes sense. And so Seeds is not taking over, you know, like your, the advisor's performance system or the overall portfolio. Like if an advisor wants to do this for a piece of the portfolio, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, go ahead. So, Kristen, is it actively managed then? Because it sounds like it's individual equities. It is. Yeah. So, there's a data driven process bringing in both um, sustainability data as well as financial data. Um, and so, it's a data driven um, funnel process. And then there is, we are actively managing it. So, um, there's not an incredible amount of turnover, but we are, you know, we have investment professionals and a committee that does look at the individual names um, daily and we have weekly investment committees. So, yes. So there's, I was just going to say that I know we're kind of short on time, but um, if you look at the fintech companies that are coming out, um, there's one that comes to mind is Positivity. 
um, they're all trying to incorporate the psychology of how to figure out really what drives your client to motivate them to, to stick with the plan and, and associate it with their core values. It's, it's, it's really powerful. I see in the industry that movement right now because um, before it was just, oh, what's your risk? You know, the question would say, you know, what's the worst investment you made and what's the best investment and what did you do when the market dropped and what did you do when the market was up? And, you know, so, I mean, yes, that tells me, I mean, it tells me a little bit about what the client's behavior is, but when you get to that behavioral finance side, all that can just be thrown out (laughs) because when they're actually put into that, into that pressure cooker, which We've seen this in all these, vol- you know, different markets, no- not normal markets. They they will act totally differently, and you will have to manage through that. So I'm actually super excited about these types of fintech companies that are coming out because the psychology of money, and how money habits and how people behaviorally, uh, you know, act yeah. or want to act is like the key to success. Yeah. I mean, values are something that are ingrained in you. And if you start the, if you have the, if the advisor has that relationship based on, on how they know their client with their values, not about the risk tolerance, which could change every day, right? Like it's a lot stickier. It's a lot more meaningful. And if you understand your client, so the profiling part of the survey I talked about, that doesn't just help an advisor talk about ESG or position values align. That helps them talk about kind of anything they're talking about with their client if they understand where their client's coming from. So mm-hmm. totally, I think for an advisor really to differentiate themselves, having the understanding of the client, building the relationship in a different way, right? Because if you just want trading, you might as well go to a robo. But the mm-hmm. advisor partner in, you know, people want someone to be partner with them and help them with their life decisions. So, so enable like having that dialogue about values and what's important, how you make decisions. And then, you know, being able to align their investments in that way, just like anything else is really, um, you know, today and the future, right. Of investing. Yeah. Yeah. And I love, <laughs> I love it. And, you know, Gigi is full transparency, my uh, financial professional, and she knows my passion for this. And I think she shares it as well. So I'm glad she, you were able to jump in. Me too, thanks. Um, uh, do we have to hang up? Pardon me? I have like two more quick questions. Go ahead, go ahead. I mean, okay. I'm, I'm gonna stay on if you can, Kristen. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, uh, real quick, um, Kristen Hafner, you've yes, got to yeah. look at behaviordna.com. They are the end all be all. They are the absolute best on the market. In fact, Fidelity is just, I think, going to be engaging them. You've got to look yeah. at them. If y'all, if you want to talk separately with me about it, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, I'm, you know, I'm about to put Barb and Michael through it. <laughs> but well, I'm, and I'm, I appreciate you sharing. This is why the power of all of us, because women adv- uh, financial advisors love to collaborate. Um, Mm -hmm. and share, even though we all, you know, do the same thing. We don't do all the same thing, but we have different passions. Um, But I'm on the New Century Council for Cambridge Investment Research, and I'm supposed to be in charge of looking like five, seven years out. And I am constantly bringing this to their attention of incorporating this into, and and they're so far behind. And, you know, (laughs) I'm one of three women on this council. And- the three of us are just like, and, and I'm frustrated. So when you give me this, it's just like the most awesome thing to find out these things that are coming uh, out so that I can- Take, well, take a look at it. Uh, Gigi's, uh, Gigi's mantra as well. It's my, it's my language. Take a look at it and feel free to ping me separately and we can talk. Okay, um, awesome. Kristen O'Grady, um, and, and you'll see when you look at behavioral DNA, Kristen Hafner, mm-hmm. I'm a driver, <laughs> right? <laughs> But uh, Kristen O'Grady, um, can you talk a little bit about the cost structure? Because part of the challenge is, especially when we're looking at something like a seeds or something like that to put onto a 401k um, platform or to put into an individual um, client's platform, typically F- ESG or SEG, depending on what you're looking at, um, can be a little bit more expensive. Can you speak to that? Because we've got this layer and then we've got our investment advisory layer. And, I, and yeah. still, no matter how conscious people are, and there are people who say, I'm absolutely willing to pay a little more. When they look at those fees, they're like, oh, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. And, and I don't think ESG has to be more expensive. Maybe some of the funds are, if you're talking about more expensive yeah. than funds. Um, so, so seeds like a sub advise, it's just like a sub advisor. So you, advisors have sub advisory relationships. So um, the market for this is probably 60 basis points. We have a lower fee with our, the client we're launched with. So we work from 45 to 60 basis points. Now that would be similar since it's an SMA, that would be similar to having a mutual fund. That okay. Okay. So same way, less trading, lower costs. The 1% but this would be like an, a sub-advisor. Um, there also would be a monthly charge to an advisor just like for like the tool use, right? So like, just like you're paying $100 a month for Morningstar, or what, you know, whatever other tools you're using, um, there would be like a licensing fee for that. Um, so like, let's say there are 80 advisors. So we're, we're a billion dollar RIA with folks and we're growing and we're around the country. So it would be, and I, and I don't mean to get this granular, I'm just curious if there's an annual, because I'm going straight to my SBC on this. So, so I, maybe you and I should talk separately. Yeah, let's talk. I mean, it's definitely negotiable. And for our first, you know, we're, we're launching a $5 billion RA right now. In and New Jersey. In New Jersey, yep. And so their 50 plus advisor teams are using this. And for them, we, you know, we, of course, since they're the first client, there's a deal. So it's all negotiable, but yeah, for the client, I don't think it has to be more expensive. I don't think the whole, like you're paying more for ESG is necessarily a thing. I think because ESG um, is the future of investing. I was saying this in the beginning, like, it's not like the separate asset class, like, oh, I'm investing in real estate. So we're going to, you're going to pay yeah. more. It's really how, and BlackRock saying this, everyone's saying this, it's really how we're going to invest in the future. It's not a thing. So if the prices, if the fees of the funds are not the same now, they will be. Right, right. There will be some equalization. And the confusing part is, you know, every single perspective now, everyone's putting ESG in their perspective. Yeah. yeah. So the reason, and um, someone asked about the active management, the reason I think active management, some active management makes sense right now is because there's no consistency in the data that companies are reporting. And then there's so many now ESG data providers, which are awesome, but nothing's consistent. So I think it makes sense to not just go by the rating, but have an investment professional then look at the companies um, and decide. Because like any asset class where there's just a lot of, what is it called? There's just a lot of different opportunities. And well, that, yeah, like, that's what concerns me is when they give you these screeners and they tell you they have a proper ESG you know, offering to you, it's, it's really not. <laughs> so, um, yeah. and, and I agree with Gigi's point about the fee structure, because that's a whole nother conversation. We can do a whole other conversation on that. Um, but um, it's just, you know, the clients don't understand it. So, um, it, you know, and then the other thing is when you get to these larger RAs or even a broker dealer like Cambridge, you know, them seeing the value to the street sometimes doesn't cross over and then they try to do it themselves and then they step in a lot of holes and they can't launch it and they spend a ton of money <laughs> so yeah. um and that, yeah that's why like companies like yours need to come mm-hmm. you know we need to inter, you know put pressure on to get you up there because i'm tired of seeing um these types of programs start and then fail <laughs> on their face yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we're right now we're doing very white gloves. So we're meeting with the advisory teams and trying to help them. Like, how do you launch as the clients? Like, what do you say? Um, so really handholding so that they're comfortable because it is really what we're what we're selling is an onboarding process, right? So it is a change to like an advisor's process, but we think it's a it's a necessary one for the future to talk about their value, you know, to bring in the values and personalization in this way. So it's, it's not like trying to sell a product. It's trying to really like help an advisor differentiate themselves in the future. But anybody, I, I, I would gather, and this is a gross generalization, but I would gather that women in general are better fact finders. It's a terrible gross generalization. I apologize. But I work, at, there's one of me out of 80 of us, one female, yeah. right? And so, and, I, and I, I, I love a lot of the guys, not all of them, but a lot of them that I work with. And they're not, Fact finders, and I would say that everybody on this call who is in our business, we're all female. I bet we rock at fact finding, and I bet we all do something like that seeds 
Pathfinder in some shape or form, right, ladies? Yep. And mm-hmm. it's because we want to know. We want to know because, and I and I, I think it makes it makes perfect sense. I'm going off on a tangent, sorry, but I, I think that this is how we work anyway, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. If it's if it's what it's, I've always said that. I mean, there's nothing wrong with male advisors, but I've always felt a passion that women advisors have that DNA to um, explain things better, investigate things better. Uh, We have a better sense of our gut. Uh, We listen, Mm -hmm. I think, better. (laughs) I mean, I can't tell you like 10 years ago when I transitioned over how many of, I love my male advisors I work with, um, but they told me I was crazy for trying to figure out how to use the spend dashboard on e-money and really engage my clients in paying attention. And and they said, are you crazy? And why? And I said, well, if they spend more than they have, then you won't have a job <laughs> to manage anything. But they don't want to put that effort in. So, um, and they don't want to have a conversation and they don't want to get paid. Yeah, those pain points. And that's um, why I got, yep, that's yeah, why I coach. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I remember when I took this, this was that. my last story, but when I took the CFP, we did a, you had to do a case study. It was back when it was the big case study that you had to do. And I was in a room with 10 other male and advisors doing the CFP. And it came down in the case study to the husband selling the boat to pay for the college. Right. And, and, and I recommended he sell the boat because he wasn't using it. And at least 80% of them said, you can't do that to him. You're going to take away his (laughs) boy. I was like, what the hell? It's a depreciating asset. Yeah, right. I was like, what the hell? You know, like, how could you not recommend that that boat be sold, considering how much it costs, you know, and and where they were in life? And and they're like, no, you would decimate his, you know, self-esteem. And I was like, what the heck? This is why, you know, I want to talk more about female financial advisors, because, yeah, I'm so glad you guys are already involved in, like, talking about values and all of that. And so... I feel like that's, you know, great for us to talk about, you know, with people that get it. Right. So, um, so I'd love to, you know, continue. I know we're running around up on time. I'd love to talk one-on-one with anyone who's interested in learning more. Um, And honestly, it's been wonderful being just in in sustainable finance, like in the industry, because it's like you said, with financial, female financial advisors, I feel like that in the sustainable finance industry, like even competitors will have conversations with and like, it's like everyone believes in it and is like into helping each other. So I think that's so, so important. It, and I would add, you guys are the experts, but I love what I'm hearing. I love the dialogue. I love the energy behind it because we see how how juicy, gooey, yummy this is because it really is aligning with us. And, um, you know, I will say that, as you well know, 70% of women will leave their male com- um, advisor because they haven't built a relationship. And this is a relationship building tool, uh, asking about what are your values, what's important to you, you know, and really having these kind of le- deeper level conversations and really managing the money accordingly. I think it really closes the loop. You know, we tell women, you vote with your money, you know, like um, I was telling someone the other day, I, I, you know, I invest in female owned small businesses as much as I can. If I have to order something for my business or buy a gift or something, because that's what's important. And we tell other women in purse strings, vote with your money. You're powerful with your money. Speak with your money. And when they go to start investing in themselves by investing it doesn't go into a black hole. The conversation doesn't end like I invested, yay me. Okay, let's take that a step further. Where did that money get invested in and what are the rippling impacts of that? So I think it really closes the whole loop and really super empowers women to know the impact of their hard earned money. You know, like Maggie was saying, they work 40 hours a week, you know, to earn the money, you need to start learning about how you can leverage all that hard-earned money and really leverage for yourself, for your communities, for other things in the world. And, you know, um, I just think it's social impact is huge. I think it's going to be exponential. I think, Kristen, you've got yourself in a really sweet spot here. Um, and Gigi and I, you know, we're, we're going to have a lot of drinks and talk about how we're going to really push a lot of this forward um, because it's a mission and it's important to purse strings. And I think it's important to the world. So that's my <laughs> super important. 
Super important. And, and yeah. Woman's number one fear is investing. It is. And, <laughs> and that is what I coach on the most. You know, you get your money shit together, but then what do you do with it? Yeah. And it's, it's getting them into the invest. It's getting them over the fear. And that's so, why the psychology I, of money is yeah. so important. And understanding that you align, that your investment are aligned with your goals. Oh my God, I could go on, but this is no, what I, I know. I get over excited and over when and they, over again. They, I get excited when they, t- they call me and they say, Oh, I checked out this position of stock. And what do you think? Or like, they're mm-hmm. actually like researching it online and with their morning coffee. I like get super excited because these are things that they just never wanted to do before. And, and they actually enjoy it. And when they mm-hmm. find out you know what it's they not do. It's taking the step right yeah. it's taking the first step yeah. and education is the first step yeah, yeah. yeah. anyways i have to run ladies i'm yeah. sorry but this has been amazing this has so, been awesome yeah. hey kristen ping yeah. me uh-huh. find me i'm on pursestrings.com yeah. i will i will i just that's yeah, yeah. Okay. That's, that's i just figured okay. out how to use Thanks. all of that so yes yeah, so <laughs> okay. i will all right. All right. Take nice care, ladies. Bye. 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 Bye, Kristen. Bye-bye. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to reach out to continue the discussion, I'd love to. Um, yeah. Investor.com. Um, or, so where are you located, Kristen? Uh, New York. New York. New York, New York? Uh-huh. Yep. In the city. I love New York. I might have to just come visit. <laughs> Or um, please link. It'll be an in-person <laughs> meeting. <laughs> you want to do an in-person meeting? I'm happy to, to host oh, in yeah. Manhattan. Um, <laughs> what are you on LinkedIn, Kristen? Yeah. So please find me, Kristen O'Grady, um, in okay. LinkedIn, and or um, www.seedsinvestor.com. Um, and, and Kristen, yeah. you can get on purstrings.co and reach out to all of these lovely women as well that way. Um, so you know where they all are. Yeah. yeah. And thank yeah, you. So would you, much would you find me? Because I'm going to, I. Awesome network. I just changed. I have to jump on another call. But okay. I wanted, yeah. I wanted to jump on this call and say hello. This was really, really important to me. So I, I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. Again, I apologize for being late and leaving early. Um, oh, that's all right. Okay. <laughs> Talk to you later. And you did that. Yeah, this was great. This conversation, I think we could have talked for a few more hours, um, just mm-hmm. listening and hearing. And I think there's a lot of energy behind this. So um, I welcome all of you that came today. Kristen, thank you so much for all that you do and for presenting today. And let's keep the conversation going um, and see how we can push this important mission forward. I'd love to. Absolutely. Yeah. Talk to everyone soon. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Kristen. And you too, Kathy. Oh, yeah, right. you too. Yeah. Have Bye-bye. a great weekend, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.